Hello. Hi, Natasha. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Perfect. Let me, um, oops. I want to make sure. How do I, is there a way to, there's no way to blur the background, is there? No, I don't think so. No problem. There we go. Just do that. Okay. Um, and so. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're going to get started at uh, 2.40. So okay. we still have a few more minutes until we're okay. going to get started. So, so I can share then, my screen right now? Yes, like my, if you'd like to. Awesome. Or actually, I think oh. um, I'm going to do an introduction first. Sure. And then I'll let you take it away after. Okay, so you don't want me to put up my, like, my first slide or anything like that? No, not yet. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, until 2.40, you can you can stay on camera, you can turn your camera off, you can mute yourself, whatever okay. Sounds you good. feel like. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, so it is 2.40, so I think that it would be great to get started now. So before I hand it over to Natasha, I'm just gonna do a little bit of an introduction. So hello, welcome to the final speaker session of the afternoon. My name is Lauren Pastor, and I'm a member of the Western Mustangs team. This session will last about 40 minutes and speakers will take a break at 15 minutes to answer a few questions and then return to their presentation and we'll conclude with a few more questions. Following this session, we will wrap up our Stay in the Game conference. I encourage the use of the chat function to generate conversations and questions. This is how you will communicate. Um, only presenters and moderators will have access to the audio slash visual components. And please use the chat function ensuring the session chat is selected to communicate and ask questions through the sessions. 
So I am pleased to introduce Natasha Wesch, who will be speaking about mental health and self-care for sport volunteers and professionals. Natasha is a mental performance consultant and counselor and an educator in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Western University which is ironic because I'm actually in the Faculty of Health Science. Um, <laughs> she works directly with athletes and coaches, focusing on enhancing performance through the mental health and emotional aspects of sport. In exciting news, Natasha has just been named the mental health or mental performance lead for the Special Olympics Canada national team. Natasha holds an MA in counseling psychology, an MSc in exercise biochemistry, and a PhD in sports psychology. Natasha represented the represented Rugby Canada in two championships at the international level, and after retiring as an athlete, she coached the Rugby Canada Women's Junior and Senior programs. Natasha coached the Western Women's Rugby team as well, winning multiple OUA championships and two national championships throughout her 22 years with the Mustangs. Today, Natasha participates in triathlons and adventure racing, plays squash and hockey, and coaches minor sports as a volunteer. Um, while here with us today, Natasha will dive into mental health and self-care for sport volunteers and professionals. And it is with great pleasure that we welcome Natasha West. Natasha, you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. Thanks for that introduction. Super excited to be here. Um, so, Lauren, can I ask you at the the 15-minute point to give me a wave because I, I'll just go on and chat so that I can take a break and open it up for questions, okay? Of course. I will timer right now. I'll try and okay. interrupt you at like a natural break. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, and I will get started. Okay, so can you, I don't know why I can see this, but can you see that? It looks you perfect can? to me. Okay, awesome. You can only see like the screen. You can't see all these other things on there. No, I just see the screen. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you again. So I'm uh, super honored to be a part of today's speakers and uh, I'm thankful to be able to share with you some strategies, tactics and uh, best practices to help you look after yourself and by extension to look after others. So when I deliver presentations, I always say to the uh, to the audience members, uh, think of today as a buffet. Uh, I'll put a lot out there on the buffet table and there'll be a lot of things that maybe you've tried before. Um, many that you haven't, uh, and you don't have to try everything or, or eat it all. You, I encourage you to try something new, to come back to the buffet once in a while and try something different. And then as you move through life, not necessarily for the next 10 years that you move through life, but maybe over the course of the next few weeks or few months, expand your palate and include new and different things. All right. So, um, I just put this up there because I have to for my, um, professional practice, I have to disclaim that this is not a therapeutic session, um, but I encourage you to take notes as we go along um, and really try to apply this to your personal context and to the context of either as yourself as a coach, as an athlete, or um, working with athletes. All right, so self-care and mental health are huge umbrella terms that can incorporate so many different concepts and ideas. In fact, I could spend an entire semester, which I have, uh, diving into self-care practices and how to enhance mental health. But given that, that uh, we only have less than an hour, actually 40 minutes together, my aim is not to give you an overview of everything out there. So rather, I want to give you a few foundational ideas that will help you better understand what is self-care, what is mental health, the importance of self-care, and how you can create your own self-care habits and game plan to enhance mental health and maximize performance. Now that's a mouthful and it seems like a lot to cover in this short period of time, but I'm up for the challenge, so uh, here we go. First and foremost, I wanna be clear with one thing. When talking about mental health and self-care, it's also important to talk about mindset. So allow me to set the stage here. The majority of, if not all, individuals who excel in a specific domain, whether it be in business, in sport, in arts, in whatever aspect of life, consider themselves to be a version of a perfectionist, extremely hard on themselves, uh, expecting nothing less than the best from themselves, some sort of combination, if not all of those. In fact, almost every single female athlete and coach that I work with will describe themselves in this way. So I'm here to tell you that these traits aren't bad. 
And we certainly don't want to squash these characteristics. In fact, these aspects of our personality are likely a huge reason why we've have accomplished so many awesome things. I'm also here to tell you that too much of anything, a good thing, a great thing, is rarely good. Case in point. All right. So how many of you believe that vegetables are good for you? Raise your hand if you agree, even though I can't actually see you raising your hand right now. So I'm going to guess that over, I don't know, 90% of you just raise your hand. You know that vegetables are good for you. Now, if I give you a carrot or even a bunch of carrots, you can eat them and you'll feel pretty good. Unless, of course, you're allergic to carrots. But let's pretend that's not the case right now. But what if I gave you a ton, like a literal ton of carrots? and I asked you to eat them, eat them all. I've never tried that before, but I'm betting you'd feel pretty sick. So too much of a good thing can actually be <laughs> a bad thing and have negative consequences. So the same goes with perfectionism, right? The same goes with being hard on yourself and demanding nothing less than the best from yourself at all times. But there's a caveat. So Perfectionism is a term that we often use to describe ourselves when we want to be great and want to be the best that we can be. But sort of there is this hint of negativity about it, right? Like we know that there's something just not right about being a perfectionist, but we also cling to the word because it's like this badge of honor. So I want to break down perfectionism a little bit. Um, perfectionism is made up of two pieces. There's perfectionistic strivings and perfectionistic concerns. So they're interrelated constructs and we have a little bit of both within us and that's okay. So here's an analogy that I, I use to explain perfectionism. Now, those of you who know me, and I know there's a few out there, um, you know that I use a lot of analogy. So, um, but this one's been tested. I tested this one on my husband and he said it worked. So let's say you're climbing up a ladder, okay? So you're climbing up this ladder Perfectionistic strivings refers to the concept of looking up at the top of the ladder, being motivated and exciting, excited to get to the top because you know that's where you're aiming to go. You're willing to do the work required to put one foot in front of the other, to reach one arm over the other and to climb the rungs of the ladder one at a time, even though it might be a long, tough climb. You judge yourself by the progress you're making up the ladder, looking at it, each rung climbed as a small win, a gain, in some, you're striving for the top of that ladder and you are present. You're focused on what you're doing in the moment. As I describe that, you probably know that feeling. You've been in that spot before in your life in sport. It's a powerful feeling, right? All right. So on the other hand, perfectionistic concerns is subtly yet vitally different. So you're climbing that same ladder, but your mindset is different. You look at the top and you're concerned about how far you have to go to get to the top. You worry that you might not get there and you worry about the consequences of not getting there. You're hesitant because you can see how much is left to climb. Even with each step and reach you make and even though you move up rung by rung, all you see is how far away from the top you are. You don't celebrate the small wins of making up one rung of the ladder because you're so concerned with how much more there is to do. You become discouraged, you focus on the pain in your arms and your legs from the arduous climb. You judge yourself as being too slow, not fast enough, not good enough because you're still so far from the top. And no matter how much you climb, you never feel like you're made, you've made any progress. You never feel good enough. You're always focused on what you don't have and what's still left to climb. You're not present or celebrating the small wins. And as I describe that, you likely know that feeling too. You've been there before in sport and in life. And it's a powerful feeling. So why does this matter and what do we do about it? So it matters because although the difference is subtle, the long-term impact of this mindset will be dramatic. In a nutshell, I argue that it's okay to be hard on yourself and be demanding of excellence, but it's not okay to be harsh with yourself and expecting perfect perfection. Think about that for a moment. Being hard on yourself and demanding excellence will empower you to be the great woman that you are. 
It will empower you to be bold, to be strong, to take risks, make mistakes and bounce back, and to strive for the stars without undervaluing what you've achieved to date. But the latter, being harsh with yourself and expecting perfection and only perfection, and then looking at yourself with disgust when you don't achieve it, not only is it unattainable, but it is supremely detrimental and will always, always undermine your abilities and your potential for optimal performance. So I know what you're thinking because I think this too, don't get me wrong, right? You're thinking, but Natasha, that's a great mindset for everybody else, but that's not me. I can't do that because if I don't expect perfection, if I'm not brutally honest and brutally harsh with myself, I'll turn into a sloth. I'll lose my edge. I'll get nothing done and I will accomplish nothing. I know I get it. I get it. But that mindset is this all or none lie we tell ourselves. And I know it's a scary place to go to let go of that mindset because for most of us as women in sport and in life, we've had to fight to get to where we are. We've had to stand up for our rights. We've had to be stronger and do more and speak louder in order to be heard and be seen. And that's how we've survived. That's how we've made it. But I want you to hear this. Yes, demand great things of yourself. Ask yourself to make excellent choices at every decision point possible. And know that getting it right 100% of the time, it's not possible and not necessary. There's no such thing as a perfect life without error. In fact, those of you that were in Vicky Sonohara's talk just before, you heard her talk about this. But there is such a thing as an excellent life. And to achieve excellence, you need to experiment and figure out your own path, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. All experiments have a margin of error. Scientists, they always account for a minimum of 5% error in their research because they know there's always going to be human error. They plan for human error. Scientists make room for error and so should we. We are imperfect as human beings. That's what makes us unique. Life, the very fact that we are alive is a complex process that requires so many things to function at the same time. In fact, when I think of all the things that need to work together in the human body, each organ, each muscle, each limb, each joint, each synapse in the brain, each molecule in the body for us to be able to perform, let alone in our sport. It's a wonder and a miracle that we're actually able to put one foot in front of the other. Think of that. Okay, so just to say hi requires this bazillion things to take place in the body and brain in a coordinated effort and process, right? We're not even talking about sport performance. We're not even talking about competing on the international stage. We're just talking about saying hi. We have to think about what we want to say our brain has to connect with the muscles of our mouth and our tongue to formulate the right shape to create the sound while at the same time our lungs have to inhale and exhale the right amount of air to go through our vocal cords at the right moment with the exact force to somehow create an audible sound that comes out of our mouth and goes to the space between you and me. Then somehow you hear that wave of energy. What? Like, do you know how many things have to go right for that to even happen? And we expect perfection from ourselves? So, um, actually, I think, think I just missed something I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I've missed one thing. So. I wanted to say here is that let's be honest with ourselves, right? Let's be, let's be compassionate with ourselves. Yes, we want to demand excellence and we want to allow room for error. You'll get to the top and you'll be a much more enjoyable ride um, and a climb up the ladder. So now we can look at self-compassion, the self. Self-compassion, um, self-compassion. Sorry, Natasha. Yeah. Sorry, just before you, I think this would actually be a good time to break sure. your questions just after that slide. So if you don't mind, sure. could you actually go back to that slide just in case sure. it prompts some people to ask questions? Yes. There we go. Yeah. 
Perfect. Cool. So now that we're into the presentation a little bit, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I will get us started off with a question. Um, so this is, as I mentioned before, I'm I'm a health science student. So in first year, I had to take um, well-being and resilience with Marnie mm -hmm. Wedlake in in first semester. So we talked a lot about resiliency and how your mindset can like impact how resilient you are. And so for me as an athlete, I know a lot of the time, like I do struggle with perfectionistic concerns all the time. It's like, I'm not getting better fast enough. Like, what am I, what do I need to do to get better fast enough? I really struggle to like really embrace the journey and, and, and celebrate those small wins. So I guess I want to ask you, like, how do you find um, that perfectionistic concerns impact resiliency later on? Because I know you touched a little bit upon mm -hmm. like being hard versus harsh, mm -hmm. but I guess, and also what are some mechanisms that you can use to change or to attempt to shift your mentality from hard versus harsh? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, we all have both of those, the perfectionistic strivings and perfectionist concerns. We don't have one or the other and we have this combination, but the idea and, and, and what the research shows is if we can minimize the perfectionistic concerns and maximize the perfectionistic strivings, that's going to have a huge impact on our mental health, our mindset, our resiliency, because it's kind of like this two to one ratio, right? Like, yes, we want to be positive with ourselves, but if we're always positives, we kind of, that doesn't work either. So we do want to have these concerns because there is this concern with being the, the best and, and what else do I need to do to get better? right? We want to have that concern, but we don't want to have more concern than striving. We want to be striving for the next level. We want to be striving and looking and, and always wanting and enjoying the climb. So one of the mechanisms that I, I like to use with the athletes that I work with and, and even with the coaches is to think of it as if you're coaching somebody, if you are encouraging or coaching somebody that you actually like then or you're talking to a sibling how would you talk to them if they were struggling with something would you be overly nice would you be overly you know kind of frou-frou with things probably not right you would you know you would be you know, straightforward and honest with them but you also wouldn't be harsh with them because that wouldn't be motivating so i like to think of it as self-coaching right? Coach yourself in a way that you would want to be coached. Be hard on yourself, demand excellence from yourself, be honest with yourself, but gosh, don't be so harsh that you don't want to keep going, that you want to just give up. That's not going to motivate you to keep going. That's certainly not going to motivate, motivate you to get better. And I'm going to talk a few more about a few more things later, but hopefully that kind of answers your question. Oh, yes, that did. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I think we also have another question. Sure. Um, do you have any daily routines, mantras, et cetera, that help you with your mental well-being? Ah, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to actually not answer that right now because I'm going to answer it in the next few slides. So, um, just hold on to that question. Cause I will answer that for sure. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess right now we can continue with the presentation at the end, there will be, um, an opportunity to ask more questions. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question yet, um, or you're just saving it till later, you will definitely have an opportunity to ask that later. So yeah, Natasha, you can continue. Awesome, thank you. All right, where are we here? Okay, so we were talking about self-compassion or about to talk about self-compassion. So self-compassion means being warm and understanding toward ourselves when we suffer, when we fail, or when we feel adequate, rather than ignoring our pain or flagellating ourselves with self-criticism, right? The key thing here is that self-compassion is the difference between being hard on yourself versus being harsh, and it's the difference between demanding excellence and expecting perfection right? That means that we're going to suffer, we're going to fail. And sometimes we are going to feel inadequate. But instead of like being harsh on ourselves, and like it says here, flagellating ourselves with self criticism, that's when we need to have a little bit of warmth, right? So self compassion, that's, that's quite the word, right? That's quite the concept. And for many high achievers and high performers, that word comes with a whole lot of baggage, right? Like being nice to yourself, putting your self care as a priority, like no way, I don't have time for that. Who has time for that? Like, I still think that sometimes, right? And this is what I do for a living. 
but but here's the catch, right? Yes, I still have a hard time being nice to myself, taking time for myself and caring for myself, but I practice using the mindset of excellence versus the mindset of perfection, which means that I catch myself when I think that I'm not worth the time. I catch myself when I think that taking care of myself might wash away my edge and intensity. Um, and I catch myself and, and then I make the decision to be the best version of myself. And the best version of myself is to come to a decision point and make the excellent choice. I choose to care for myself because I know, and science shows it, that if I engage in self-compassion and I take care of myself, that I will be stronger, that I will be tougher, that I will be better able to go out and conquer the world. I'll also be better able to care for others. So self-compassion requires self-awareness. Self-awareness means asking yourself, what do I need to be the best that I can be? What makes me feel good about myself? What me feeds my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit? Now, I know the answers to those questions when it comes to myself as an athlete preparing for competition, right? That is, I know the answers when it comes to the technical, the tactical, and even the physical parts of my game. I have a training plan and a game plan, and you do too, right? But what about us as a human being? What about you as a human being? What about your training plan? What's your game plan to be the best human being that you can be? And this is where self-care comes into play. Now let's define the terms. What exactly is self-care? Self-care is defined as the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness, in particular during periods of stress. Now, as athletes, we take a lot of care to be the best we can be as athletes. As I said, we take an active role in training and developing the skills, the strategies, the physical aspects of our bodies to prepare us to face athletic challenges, to face the stresses of sport. We have fairly specific routines that we follow, right? We go to great lengths to control the controllables when it comes to athletic performance. Yet, we don't approach our general life in this way, at least not for the most part. Sometimes we do it when we've hit rock bottom, when we're so fatigued, worn out, burned out, stressed out that taking care of ourselves is the only option left. But what I'm proposing today is an approach to your self-care in the same way that you approach your training as an athlete. In sport, you don't wait until you're in the depths of pressure or combat to start your training to begin your preparation. Of course not. Right? That would be unheard of. You wouldn't wait until the night before the championship to start training your forehand or to get started in the weight room, right? You'd be proactive. In fact, you'd start months out to ensure that you establish a strong foundation that you could rely on come final. Well, self-care is the same thing. Self-care is, by definition, proactive. So let's talk about self-care, self-care habits, and self-care routines. So actually, before I go into self-care habits and routine, I'm going to explain the traffic light zones and uh, of self-care and stress. So this diagram is actually used to help manage depression, but I find it really useful to help athletes understand how stress, mental health and self-care are interrelated. So let's first look at this from a perspective of sport performance. Right. So think about your training in your sport and I'll just use the example of running. So the green zone is the comfort zone. When things are comfortable, manageable, you can spend a whole lot of time in the green zone. Your capacity in this zone is high. Um, uh, sorry, your capacity in this zone is high. It, in a way, it's like a recovery run, right? You can hang out in this zone pretty much forever. The orange zone is the challenge zone. It's when things are tough. As athletes, we know how to get into this zone and we spend a large part of our training in this zone. This is where we push the boundaries. This is where we get, uh, we get into in, in order to be better. Our capacity in this zone is moderate. That means that we can spend time here, but eventually we'll need to recover to get back to the green zone to allow the body to get into repair mode so that the mad damage that we do in the orange zone gets repaired and the body then adapts to train. The red zone, this is a picture of my daughter when she was, I don't know, quite a few years ago in the red zone. The red zone is like the full out sprint, the maximal effort, the really heavy zone. We can go there. In fact, as athletes, we've learned to ignore the physical cues that tell us that this is the danger zone. We can step into this zone, but our capacity to stay in this zone is low. 
we can go here, but not for long. And then we need a lots of recovery time. We need to move back into orange and actually even to green. So as athletes, we know the physical signs and symptoms that tell us when we're each in, in each of these zones, right? Green zone, super easy. We can joke around and laugh. Body feels good. Orange zone, a bit more serious. We know there'll be discomfort. Our body is under stress, but we can manage it, but not for long. Red zone, that's painful. We know that way too much time here will result in damage and we'll pay the price later on. So through physical training, we develop the self-awareness to know when we're each in each of these zones, when we need to back off and move back into recovery zone. Um, we learn to recognize when we're moving from one zone to the other. We know this in terms of physical fitness, but what about the mental, emotional, psychological signs and symptoms that tell us when we're in each zone when it comes to our mental fitness and mental health? So today, if you take nothing else from what I've shared with you, I want you to take away this. Train yourself to recognize your emotional and psychological uh, signs and symptoms that tell you when you're in each zone, when you're moving from one zone to the next, right? This is uh, a key aspect of mental health and mental fitness. Once you can recognize your signs and symptoms, you'll be able to take action to ensure that you maintain and develop mental health and mental fitness. So what are the things that you do daily to enhance your performance as a human being? What are the things that you do daily to create, to care for your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit? When you care for those aspects of yourself, you give yourself the best chance of success. So I wanna go through this really quickly. So this is the signs and symptoms from the emotional and psychological perspective, right? So when I'm in the green zone, my mood is stable, I'm sleeping well, eating well, I feel positive, hopeful, optimistic, so on and so forth. When I'm in the orange zone, I'm irritable, I'm not sleeping, I have a hard time fall asleep, I'm scatterbrained. When I'm approaching the red zone or I'm in the red zone, I feel overwhelmed, super stressed, like I can't concentrate on anything, I'm irritable and I feel like there's no end in sight. I just can't keep to find the positive or can't seem to find the positive in anything. Like I just want the world to stop so that I can catch my breath. The key is to have all of this written down. Like I have this written down. I know this. I know what I'm like in each zone and I know when I'm moving through of each zone so I can recognize those signs and symptoms. That's part of the mental game plan. I have a look at my signs and symptoms sheet and recognize where I am. It's my mental game plan. And I encourage you to have this. And those of you that are working with athletes, I encourage you to help them develop this. What are those signs and symptoms? So the other key to my mental game plan is that I have taken the time to identify what self-care strategies I can and uh, I can use and need to use when I'm in each of these zones. So for example, um, I meditate daily, even if it's just five minutes. Okay, sometimes I miss my meditation, but I'll talk about that in a second. I go for a walk or a hike daily, even if it's just for 10 minutes around the block. I work out daily. Um, so meditate, hike. Uh, I even write in my journal pretty much every day. And sometimes my journaling is not fancy. It's super basic. And it's basically me writing the date, making a big sad face or happy face, depending on how I'm feeling, um, and listing out all the emotions that I'm feeling in that moment. And that's just my brain dump. I get it down onto paper. I also vent. <laughs> I vent. And in my family, we it sounds horrible, but we allow ourselves to vent. You know, sometimes just for five minutes. Like my daughter will come home from school and it's just like, blah, just vent, vent, vent. But then once that's out, it's out. It's kind of like the stress release. But then we uh, add in these positive coping mechanisms, which I'll talk about. Right. So and I sleep. Uh, sleep is my superpower. Granted, sometimes I miss out on it, but I try to prioritize my sleep. Right. And I have a routine at night that I follow and I try to get to bed by 10, 10, 15 so that I can wake up around 730, 745 every morning. And I start my day all over again with my meditation. And I know this sounds boring, but think a bit of the routine we have as athletes, right? We go to training every day, do the same or similar skills or exercise, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's actually kind of boring what we do. And like training for sport, I know there's no such thing as perfection. So when life gets in the way and I miss my morning practice, I don't beat myself up and call myself names for not meditating. I just get back at it the next day and I start again. Right. So the key thing is I know if I'm in the orange zone, I have lots of work to do. And when life throws me into the deep end, I know I need to up the ante on some of these self-care habits. So if that's why it's important to recognize what zone you're in. 
right? So I tend to make space in my calendar for those habits that really recharge me. For me, it's hiking, being with my family, and like I said, sleep. And sometimes I get into that red zone, um, but I'm much better at recognizing when I'm inching my way from orange to red um, so that I can intervene sooner with some of these uh, tactics. So yes, I spend time in the red zone, but I spend as little time in there as I can. And I make sure that I spend a whole lot of time in my green zone after that stint in the red zone. Okay, so examining your own self-care habits is an important first step in developing self-care plan, right? How do you typically deal with life's demands? Can you identify what you need and when you need a break? So I've put some positive uh, coping strategies as well as some negative coping strategies here. Um, but, you know, you can find a whole lot of them. If you search these, you can find them, but I'll go through them really quickly. Um, when faced with challenges, we can use either positive, positive or negative coping strategies. Now, I want to be clear that negative coping doesn't mean that never to be used, right? But it's rather to be used in an acute setting. It's like the, it's the, in other words, it's the quick release, but not to be used chronically. So in other words, long term. So for example, I mentioned that my use of quite a few of these coping strategies, many of which are positive coping strategies already, like deep breathing, meditation, reading, going for a walk, so on. But I also mentioned using some negative coping strategies, such as venting. But when I use negative coping strategy, like venting, I also tack on a positive coping strategy because I find the negative coping strategy tends to be useful sometimes for releasing the tension, but then they're not so useful for re-energizing. So which strategies do you use, right? Which ones can you try out or practice? Again, relate it back to sport. We learn new skills to help us perform better. Over the course of your sport career, have you always used the same set of skills or did your coach help you learn new skills and new strategies to enhance your performance or take it to another level? So same goes with mental skills and coping strategies. Build your mental and emotional toolbox of skills and strategies. Learn how to meditate, learn about deep breathing, go for a walk, go for a walk in nature, purposefully hang out with your friends purposefully, you know, take a bath, do all of these things, listen to music, read. All of these things are so, so important, but you have to find out the one that works the best for you. And I encourage you to not only have your self-care plan for when you're in the green, the orange and the red zone, but to, rec to have that signs and symptoms sheet so that you can recognize when you're working through that. And I did this with my daughter a while ago and it helps her. She has her toolkit that she uses when she does get into the red zone and she does freak out. She goes to that toolkit and she goes, okay, when I'm freaking out, what do I need to do? And she's got these lists of strategies that work for her written down, right? Don't keep it in your head. Your head is a great place, but it, there's too much stuff in there. Put it somewhere where you can see it, okay? So in summary, here are the key take-home messages that I hope you take from today. We are strong, high-achieving women who have and will continue to work hard to be the best that we can be. We demand great things from ourselves. And I encourage you to continue to demand excellence from yourself. And don't fall into the perfection trap. Strive for excellence in all that you do. Reach for the top of that ladder and celebrate the present moment. Remember that in every experiment, there's always a margin for error. That margin for error, that 5%, that's where the learning takes place. So don't be afraid of that error. Just like you're able to recognize the signs and symptoms of when you're physically in the green, orange, and red zones, take the time to learn and understand the signs and symptoms of when you are in your emotional and psychological green, orange, and red zones. Write this down. Have it handy. Create a self-care routine that establishes a strong foundation that then allows you to successfully navigate and manage your journey into the orange and red zone. Practice and develop positive coping strategies that you can use when you find yourself in the orange and red zones. Be prepared with your mental game plan. You are worth it. So with that, um, here are all the, the photo credits. I have to put these up. So here are all the photo credits um, for the sources of images. And then I, uh, 
wrap it up by just saying thank you. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that at the very least I've provided you some for, with some food for thought. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing and open it up to questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Natasha. We will definitely do a final wrap up once we've addressed some of these questions. Mm -hmm. But the first question that the audience has for you is, she says, I've never been able to get into journaling. Do you go back and reflect on your journal entries or is it really just important to get your thoughts on paper and out of your head? Both. <laughs> so sometimes depending on, on what it is, when I'm really like when I'm working towards something. So for example, if I'm trying to work towards, even if it's like a physical practice, like if I'm training for a triathlon or something, I'll actually enter how I'm feeling, what I'm doing. Um, and it's not a dear diary, although for some people that works, but I do go back and I'm like, oh, that worked, that didn't work. I remember when this worked and when this didn't. And, and sometimes I actually go back many years. I have all of my notebooks. Like I have a lot of them. I have all of my notebooks and I go back and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot that I used that strategy or wow, look how far I've come over the years in the way that I think. So yeah, sometimes I go back, but sometimes, like I said, it's just a brain dump. Like literally it's just like, I just need to get stuff out so that it doesn't keep swirling in my head. Right. So, um, journaling, like I said, doesn't have to be, uh, a dear diary where you write out, there's so many different ways to journal. And if, you know, that's a practice in itself, I, I spend an entire um, lecture on journaling and on, on entry, but put pen to paper as often as you can draw it out, smiley faces, you know, whatever you want, but get into that habit and, and make it work for you for sure. Um, I actually have a follow-up question to that because mm -hmm. I completely agree a lot of times like I would journal because it's like oh my goodness look how I used to talk to myself like that was so mean of me like when I get to reflect and see how far I've come but something that I've really struggled with is like maintaining journaling do you have any tips on how you can con like get consistent and get in kind of the habit of journaling yeah for sure well you know like and I, it's like any other habit and I think when when we can reflect and kind of make it uh, think of it as what we do with physical practices like how do we get into physical practice? So why do we warm up before every time we go to practice? Or maybe some people don't, but why do we do that? Because it's just part of the routine, right? And if we forget, or if we're late or something, we, we, we don't give up. It's like, just because I missed a warm up one day, I'm not like, oh, well, I'm the worst person in the, in the universe. I'm never warming up ever again, right? We go back and we go back to it. I use the toothbrush analogy and I'm stealing this from, I'm stealing the toothbrush analogy from Jennifer Brockstroman, who I, uh, I heard speak and that I, I know, um, but she uses the toothbrush analogy, right? Like we brush our teeth every night and that's something that we learned to do since we were little. And the reason that it's so ingrained and it's just part of our routine, but some nights, like I know it's happened to me, I get home late or, you know, maybe I went to a party or something and I forget and I, I don't brush my teeth. Well, I don't like, call myself names. You're the worst person in the world. I can't believe you don't, you didn't brush your teeth. You should just stop and quit oral hygiene all for once and for all you should No, you know what you brush your teeth the next day and you carry on. So if you forget to journal, carry on the next day or put it somewhere where you can see it. It's right beside my bedside. That's where my journal is. Right? So I, I that's how I use it. And I just get into habits and I help I has ask the people around me to do the same habits. Like our whole family, journals, our whole family meditates, our whole family, like it's kind of a little bit of a cult, but anyways, we do it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Cause yeah, you definitely get into that narrative of like, oh, I didn't do it one day, so I might as well not do it the next, but it's like, <laughs> why give up after one day, you know, <laughs> but thank you. Um, and somebody also asked, can you repeat the part about scientists and making room for error? Yeah. So in scientific research, we always account for this 5% margin of error, right? So we go into research knowing that we're, there's going to be error somewhere because as human beings, we're, we're faulty, we're, we're not perfect, right? And so when what I like to, I like to use that approach when we're going into life, like I'm going to make mistakes. And Actually, if I look at mistakes and I make room for mistakes like scientists do, a lot of times in those mistakes is where we learn things, right? Like think of the COVID vaccine. Like 
that's how they learned things. They made a mistake and they're like, well, that doesn't work so well. Okay. Now we need to go back and figure out how to do this differently. Or we need to be able to make this, I don't know anything about vaccines by the way, but we need to be able to make this happen and do this. Right? So the error actually provided lessons and it provided information. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to look at sport life like we're going to make errors but that gives us an idea of what we need to do maybe a little bit differently but not to just focus on the error and go oh my god i can't believe i made errors i'm such a bad person again right so hopefully that makes sense yeah it totally does thank you um i also have a question from amanda she says how can i teach my athletes to work on mindfulness do you have any tips to work on mental performance in the high performance atmosphere or even just where to start so, so there's, I think there's two part question there. Right? Um, so the mindfulness piece, you know, I think one of the things that scares so many people or, and so many, well, people, but young athletes is mindfulness. People think that mindfulness is, you know, this Zen like state where you sit cross legged, although some people do, I do sometimes. Um, and you have your hands like this and it's this arm and all this stuff, but Mindfulness, I can be mindful right now. I can just think about what does it feel like to be standing right now because I'm standing. What does it feel like to have my feet in my shoes? I'm being mindful. That's a half a second of mindfulness right there. Mindfulness means being in the present moment. And again, another analogy is I use the analogy of this balloon, right? Like our mind has this ability to time travel. Our, our mind can go to the past, it can go to the future, it can go wherever, and that's its job. It's supposed to go all over the place. Mindfulness is grabbing the balloon, which is the mind, and just anchoring it right here and going, I'm here for even a fraction of a second. And how we anchor it is we anchor it into a physical sensation, the physical body, what we hear, what we see, what we smell, what we taste, our breath. That's why the breath is used for mindfulness. So how do you answer your question? How can you teach your athletes to work on mindfulness? Just ask them to go to something like, depending on your sport, like, okay, take the ball in your hand. How do you know you're holding the ball right now? What does it feel like to hold the ball? And they have to focus on that because they don't even think about it ever. They just hold it, right? But ask them to think about it. So right away, you're grabbing that mind and you're asking them to be right here and to practice that. And then the more they practice that, just being aware of what it feels like or what it sounds like, the more able they are to bring their mind back. And then you can start to introduce the, you know, the, the fancy mindfulness with like following apps and doing all that stuff. Right. So. Yeah, for sure. And question. yeah. And um, Trisha actually made a comment too. She says, I tell my athletes to be present and purposeful and think about what they are doing this moment only yes. for a short time. I think that's exactly what you were getting at. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really awesome. Um, and I guess to kind of go off of that, like, um, again, from a coaching perspective, how can coaches create like a competitive training environment while reinforcing self-compassion mm -hmm. to their athletes and, mm -hmm. and like, how, cause I know sometimes coaches can really overwhelm athletes by like, oh, we're in a really high performance environment, but like, let's also remember to be mindful. It's like, <laughs> I don't feel like I can do both. So right. how can, like, are there any um, tips for coaches on how to like create that while maintaining a high performance environment at practice? You know, I think, and, and I can only, I'll speak from my perspective as a coach in this area is, um, you know, one of the things and, and any athletes, and I think there's some a few of my former athletes that are on this uh, in this session. Um, you know, I was always very demanding because I demanded that of myself. I demanded excellence. I demanded, you know, be on time, work hard, give your best, all of these things. But at the same time, I always was with try to be as much as possible. And I know I made errors, um, but as much as possible to connect with the athletes as human beings, because we're asking them to perform like kind of robots in a way, but we have to connect with them on the, on the level of the human being and to say, look, I know this is hard. I know this is challenging. And I'm asking you to do this because I'm pushing you into that orange zone. I'm pushing you into that red zone, but we're going to back off and we're going to go back into the green zone. And we're going to talk about how that worked for you and what you need to do now. And so, you know, it, it's how you say things too. 
right? Like I could ask people to give their best and to be really tough. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the, that was really, really demanding, but it's to also say, Hey, I know that this was tough. Now let's go and let's go and recover. Right. And Angela, there's one who's putting a comment on there. Right. Yeah, to, and as Angela said, like recognize our strengths and that's the thing, right? We used to do some things at practice and I'd be like, okay, we're gonna do this and it's gonna be tough and I'm gonna make you guys work really hard, but I'm doing this not to punish you because I'm doing this because when there's five seconds left in the game and you're in the championship final, I want you to know that you can push through this, that you have the ability to go into that red zone, even if it's just for a moment and then we'll have all kinds of time to recover afterwards. So hopefully that, again, answers the question. For sure. Because, yeah, it's definitely a balance between, right, like how much do I push my versus how do I want to show them that I'm there for them and support them. So I think that that's your answer definitely provides like a really great balance for coaches. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, the last question that we will um, answer today is, um, what's the next this might be the next phase of mindfulness but what are your thoughts on visualization do you have any visualization techniques i did a whole five years of my phd on visualization so yes um you know visualization oh, well, i can go on for this but the the if i can do this in a nutshell which i don't think i can but i'll try if i can do this in a nutshell is visualization basically it Imagery is the way you want to go. So visualization is like, you know, I see things in my mind, but imagery is the superpower or the superhero of visualization. I see, I hear, I feel, feel emotions, feel the kinesthetic awareness, smell and taste maybe. But the idea is I, I try to teach athletes like it's a, a, a layer. I'm, I'm adding layers to a movie. So first um, I get athletes to actually write out what they want to visualize rather than just sporadically or on the spur of the moment, try to visualize or imagine something. So I write, I ask them to answer the questions. What do you want to imagine? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What do you want it to feel like emotionally? What do you want it to feel like physically? What do you want it to feel like um, from a, uh, I guess, psychological perspective in a way? What do you want to be thinking? What do you want to um, to hear? Uh, what do you and hear might be what do you want to be saying? What do you want to hear from others? Um, and um, and then say, okay, once you write that down in a lot and lot of detail, as if you're writing a book and you want the audience to be able to read and understand that and actually feel that, that's how much detail, then you can close your eyes. Close your eyes and just start by seeing. What do you see? No sound, nothing else. Just what do you see? And go through all the details and try to get all the, the colors and the shapes. Then turn on the volume. Okay, what do you hear? What do you hear yourself saying? All right, now drop into your body as if you're there. You just like, boom, drop into your body. You are there. You can feel, you're like, oh my God, I can feel my hands. It's like you're the avatar in this like video game, right? I can feel my hands. I can feel my body. Start, you know, performing in your sport. What do you want to feel like? What do you want it to look like? And, and then just keep adding the layers. What do you want to feel emotionally and start behaving and, and performing the way that you want to in your sport, for example. So there's a practice of different layers. And then of course you can be like seeing out of your own eyes or like zooming out from a bird's eye view. There's so many different aspects of it. Like I, I just love imagery, but hopefully that gives you at least a starting point. Yes, thank you so much, Natasha, for that answer. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much for answering um, all of our audience questions today and obviously for your presentation. Um, thank you so much for just being here with us today and for sharing all of your knowledge on this important topic. And I just kind of wanted to end by saying like, this was really helpful for me and mental health is like a very um, key interest of mine. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to, especially like in fourth year courses, like I know there's so many in health science that are geared towards mental health. And mm -hmm. I think the biggest takeaway from this for me was I know that the whole idea that mental health is subjective is like something that really hits home in the in the health science department at Western. Um, and so even just going back to like your the idea of color zones, my team has been trying to implement that, right? Oh, cool. And the point that you made about like, train yourself to know when you move in between color zones. Like I think that that just really it's like touches upon how like it's subjective and it's so different for everyone. 
And so I think that that's just such, that was amazing for me to be able cool. to like connect all these different things from what I was learning. So thank you so much for that. And, um, and yeah, and thank you so much for being here. We really well, appreciate thank you. it. I really appreciate it. I hope, uh, I hope people took something from the buffet and, uh, and you can come back and, and grab more later and feel free. If you guys want to contact me, you guys can find me on the internet for sure. So, um, would love to answer questions if you have any others. So thanks again. And thanks for moderating Lauren. Yeah. Of course. And with that said, I'm just going to do a little bit of a closing statement since this is the last um, meeting in the conference or session in the conference. So what an inspiring conference, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our incredible speakers, panelists, and moderators for sharing your wisdom, experiences, insights, and expertise with us today, as well as our organizing committee for making this happen. And thanks to all of you who took the time to attend. This concludes the Stay in the Game Pathways for Women in Sport virtual conference. We hope you have been inspired by some of these experiences and encouraged, and we encourage you to consider what opportunities and pathways may exist for you in sport. Um, a feedback survey, resource list, and information on how to access some of the conference presentations will be sent to you by email. And we want we want to once again thank our presenting sponsors, Tourism London and Western Mustangs, as well as our silver sponsors, Russia University College, See What She Can Do, Western Driving Academy, Western Mustangs Athletic Alumni, and London Police. Um, thank you so much, and have a great rest. Have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone.